Well, good morning, everybody. I'm Jeff Carmel, and I'd like to welcome you all to today's webinar, The Soviet Roots of Today's Anti-Zionist Anti-Semitism. I'm a member of Congregation Beth Am, um, Beth Am's Jewish Israel and Advocacy Committee, also known by the acronym of JIAC. Our mission at JIAC is to mobilize support for the security of the state of Israel, to counter the alarming growth of anti-Semitism, and to promote respect for Jews in the United States and beyond. JIAC educates through emails and speaker programs like this one, and we provide timely alerts to take action when events warrant. Before I introduce our speaker, there are a few housekeeping points I'd like to make. First, I want to express appreciation to our co-sponsors, the Beth Am Jayak and the Z3 project of the Oshman Family JCC. Thanks also to our additional partners, Congregation Beth Jacob and the Sonoma County Israel Committee. There will be a question and answer session following this morning's talk, and you'll be able to submit questions both during and after the presentation using the Q&A button on your screen. Barb Windham, who is also a member of the Beth Am Jayak Committee, will be moderating the Q&A. Please keep the questions short and to the point. Because of time limitations, we will try to combine questions that are related. Lastly, the entire presentation this morning is being recorded, and it will be made available to you by email as early as tomorrow. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our amazing guest speaker, Isabella Tabarovsky, who is speaking to us this morning from Israel. Isabella is an eminent scholar of Russian history and anti-Semitism, and she has lectured widely on how Soviet anti-Zionist propaganda has become foundational to much of the anti-Semitic mindset in the United States and around the world. It's clear to all of us that October 7th marks an inflection point, not only in the safety and security of the state of Israel, but in the rapidly growing calumny of anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism. This morning, Isabella will be discussing the current alarming situation in terms of its Soviet underpinning. Isabella. Thank you so much. And uh, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you for everyone who helped organize this and promote it and for everyone who is online today. So I want to start with something that's very current, the accusations of genocide that are being leveled against Israel. I think for a lot of people, for American Jews for sure, um, it's, it's something very new and it's something that they've never heard before and it's something shocking. I mean, it's shocking for anyone. But some of us have heard this before. So if I gave you a few examples, genocide Israeli style, for example, I'm quoting, uh, or another quote, Zionist engineered genocide, or the final solution of the Palestinian question. You might think that this sounds, that this might have come from a recent campus proclamation, but it doesn't. These phrases come from this Soviet pamphlet titled, uh, Zionism counts on terror. It was published in 1984 by Novosti, a Soviet foreign propaganda arm in English. Uh, Novosti was masquerading as a news agency, but it was really a, a propaganda arm of the Soviet regime. It's a, as you can see, it's a basically a pocket-sized brochure. There are like 76 pages in it. And it was meant to promote the Soviet view of Israel and Zionism to English language audiences. So English speaking readers around the world were meant to understand that Zionists were genocidal and racist settler colonialists who deployed Nazi methods in the service of global imperialism. I'm sure it sounds familiar to those of you who are following the current rhetoric. It meant to, it portrayed Zionists as suppressing the anti-colonial national liberation struggle of the Palestinian people. So again, lots of buzzwords that sound completely contemporary. In these 76 pages of this pamphlet, variations on the words genocide, terror, and racist appear some 300 times. So that's around four per page. 
Novosti made clear, this brochure made clear that Zionists were perfidious double dealers, and they did it by associating Zionists with the CIA and MI6 and, of course, the Mossad, and they did it in a hundred instances. So kind of propagating the idea that Zionists everywhere were traitors who could not be trusted. Um, also, the readers of this brochure were told to dismiss Jewish claims of anti-Semitism as Zionist tricks meant to deflect attention from Israel's crimes. And again, I think that it probably sounds very familiar to those of you who follow the current conversation when we are told that Zionists, uh, anti-Zionism is not the same as anti-Semitism, and Zionists always uh, try to deflect that 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 everything that we the demonization of Israel that we're hearing is just criticism, and Zionists are trying to deflect attention from this criticism by calling it anti-Semitic, and in reality, it's not anti-Semitic. So, so in other words, the claim that Israel is committing a genocide against Palestinians is actually not a product of contemporary moment. It's at least 40 years old if you look at this brochure, but if you go actually even further than that in Soviet history, it's over a century old. Um, so in other words, today's, and this is just one example of something that I've been studying now for several years and lecturing for, for as, as many years, is that today's progressives are speaking the language of this old Soviet propaganda, the anti-Israel progressives. Uh, and this is really uh, extraordinary. The extent to which today's anti-Israel left reproduces the motifs, tropes, slogans, and the explanatory logic itself of, of, uh, um, of late Soviet anti-Zionist propaganda is really, really extraordinary. It's, it's truly, uh, I don't want to give a percentage, but it, it's, I mean, I would say it's 99%. They, they've, they've added some new things, and I'll mention it in, them in the end. But otherwise, the correspondence is amazing. So, uh, you know, accusations of racism were part of that propaganda. Accusations of apartheid were part of that propaganda. In that propaganda, you would hear and find Israel compared to Nazi Germany and Zionists compared to fascists and settler colonialists, et cetera, et cetera. Essentially, everything that the left hates is associated uh, began as, uh, to be associated with Israel. And it, this dates back essentially to 1967. But before I go into specific history, I want to kind of preview it by saying that, um, just to, exp to explain what this shows us beyond the specific correspondences, I think it's really important to understand this background of contemporary anti-Israel rhetoric. Because if we don't, first of all, it shows us what happens when a superpower or a state, a powerful state, adopts a conspiracy about Jews and puts it to political purposes. Because this is something that we're seeing due to various states do today. You know, Russia kind of stopped doing it for a few decades, but now it's returning to it. But outside of Russia, there are other states that are doing it. Uh, and the language is all there. The language has been was created a long time ago, and it's it's all there. And it's important to understand this history because if we don't, we might fall prey to some misconceptions. Like we might think that this language is new. You know, we often say that anti-Zionism is the new anti-Semitism. Well, there is for me as a Soviet Jew, I grew up in the USSR. It's funny. Um, and not funny to hear this, because to call this new is to erase, you know, generations, at least two, I would say it's probably the entirety of Soviet Jewish, what is it, four or five generations that lived under the Soviet Union, because the USSR was really, in fact, always anti-Zionist, but certainly the experience of Jews who lived after 1967, and not only Soviet Jews, also Polish Jews experienced this campaign. So to, in order to, you know, if we study this history, then we understand that there's actually nothing new. And we also, when we study it, we understand that we have a very long record of how anti-Zionism is weaponized against Jews. And so when we are told that, that this is not anti-Semitic, it's just anti-Zionist, you know, then we know what we know to say that it's just not true. You know, frankly, it's a lie. We have decades of documented history of how Jews were discriminated against under anti-Zionist rhetoric, precisely the kind of rhetoric that we're hearing today. And another reason to learn this history is that if we don't, we might actually think, 
or fall for a misconception that this rhetoric is a product of grassroots activism, as I think some try to tell us. Well, you know, of course, you know, this is this is you know people who believe in. Um, you know, the, in supporting the oppressed versus the oppressor. You know, th these are people who support the Palestinian cause. They came up with these ideas, but that is simply not the case. We are we are dealing here with a very sophisticated set of ideas and rhetorical devices, propagandistic ideas and propagandistic rhetorical devices, and that's what makes it so hard for us to defeat it. It's not just you know, it's not a product of a group of activists sitting in their parents' garage, you know, their friends' garage, and coming up with a few catchy slogans. It's, you know, there were real propaganda professionals, um, KGB diplomats working on this. Um, you know, the Soviet Academy of Sciences worked on this. So we're really facing a very um, sophisticated enemy, even if the state that produced it is no longer uh, around. So I want to, before we get into the specifics of the history. I want to show you a couple of slides and bear with me while I do the sharing. Let's see, screen share. Okay. And just a second, I need to put it on slideshow from the beginning. Okay, here we go. So, so this slide, is the cover of a French edition of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, okay? Produced in the 1920s. I don't think I need to explain in this audience what the Protocols of the Zion are, but what you see here is a picture, a kind of a quintessential anti-Semitic portrayal of a Jew, right? Super, simultaneously super powerful and um, less than human, right? It's, we have, it's a spider. It's an ugly spider with exaggerated Jewish features, and the spider is, is holding the world in its tentacles. By the way, it's a Bolshevik spider because this is the 1920s. Now, we know that it's a Bolshevik spider because of the five-pointed star on his cap. As we know, anti-Semitism adjusts to the current political situation, right? And in the 1920s, Europe was really fearful of Bolshevism. So, uh, so the protocols are really the expression, the quintessential expression of uh, uh, anti-Semitic conspiracy theory. This kind of anti-Semitic conspiracy theory was prohibited in the USSR. The Bolsheviks Lenin was staunchly against this kind of reactionary anti-Semitism. If you remember, the protocols came out of Russia, really, and there was a pogromist movement associated with, um, with these anti-Semitic um, ideas. And the Bolsheviks were against them, and they prohibited them. They prohibited anti-Semitism, along with all the other forms of racial discrimination. Of course, the protocols were also an inspiration for Hitler and to use the title of a history of uh, Norm Kahn, a historian of his book, uh, The a Warrant for Genocide, they really served as a warrant for Hitler's genocide in, in some way, in some, in some fashion, okay? So given all of this, given, um, uh, given all the, the nature of the protocols, given that they were prohibited in the USSR, how come we can we could have this in 1972 in the Soviet Union? This is what this is is a picture, a photograph uh, from the May Day Parade in 1972 in Moscow, and you can see I can show you these pictures together. I mean they're essentially the same, right? You have except on the right it's a three dimensional representation really of what you see on the left. It's a spider with a Jewish nose with a cap that now has a six uh, a, a star of David. It's a spider that holds the world in its tentacles. So it's the same idea, right? An ugly spider, a Jew who is a superhuman and uh, or super powerful, subhuman and super powerful, holding the world in control, controlling the world. And if there are any, any audience members who read Russian, you probably already understood that the difference here is that in the photograph on the right, it says Zionism is a weapon of imperialism. So the difference is the words, right? So here on the left, there's it's clearly Jews, Perel Juif, and on the right, it's Zionism. But you know what? The, the people who are really at the greatest advantage in the audience are the ones who don't know either French or Russian, because for you, it's particularly obvious. You're not distracted by the words. You really see the similarity of the images. And I think this is really important because in fact, and we'll get later to looking at some of the cartoons and some of the images that the Soviets produced and that we're seeing today, 
you know, when it comes to images, I think we all understand the image matters much, much more than the words surrounding it. And so whether you're talking about Jews or Zionists, if the image is the same, the import is going to be exactly the same and the import is going to be anti-Semitic. So I think I'm going to stop sharing for just a little bit and go through some history very quickly. And then we'll go back to... Um, second, oops. Let's see. I'm trying to get out of the... Oh, here we go. And stop share. Okay, here we go. Okay, so I want to go through some history just to give you um, a sense uh, of what... Uh, the Soviet Union stood for when it came to Zionism and anti-Zionism. Uh, and, and hopefully I'll go through it quickly. So, um, yeah, so the history that's most relevant to us is post-1967, and that's what we're going to spend most of our time on. And I'll explain why 67 is important, as some of you probably have already guessed. But the Soviets were anti-Zionists always. And it's, it's important to understand, because today we hear some of the things from the left that the Bolsheviks and the early communists used to say. In fact, according, based on Marxist-Leninist theory, you know, it, it rejected Zionism. It rejected Zionism for a number of reasons. Um, according to Marxism-Leninism, you know, Marxism and Soviet interpretation, uh, Jews were not uh, a nation. And so the early Bolsheviks, Lenin specifically, really, and Stalin also objected to the idea uh, that, that Jews the Jews were a nation and that they had something in common. If you remember, social, socialists, Bolsheviks, and then communists were internationalists, right? They believed that all nations need to unite. And in this case, we're talking about class struggle. So the proletarians of all countries need to unite to fight the capitalist class. And so the Bolsheviks would argue that the um, proletarians, the workers, for example, in England and in the United States and in Japan and in Russia, in Germany, and certainly Jewish workers have more in common with one another than they do with their national bourgeoisie. And so that's it's it's very different what the Zionists were saying. The Zionists were saying that Jewish workers are much closer to the Jewish, you know, capitalists because Jews are a nation. So the Bolsheviks rejected this idea. Uh, and also on the practical level, uh, Lenin really needed Jewish workers to join the revolutionary struggle. The Russian Jews, the Jews of the Russian Empire, were really the most oppressed people uh, of, in the empire. And so he really hated the fact that Zionists were, it, it seemed to him that Zionists were trying to pull the Jewish poor and the Jewish proletariat from this revolutionary struggle. So this is where the tension begins. And what the Bolsheviks are proposing to Jews is they're saying, look, you know, join us in this revolutionary struggle, join us in the building of socialism, and you will be, all of the restrictions that you experienced will be lifted. You know, you will be, you will have full rights. You can join us in, in everything. You can get, you can do whatever you want, join any profession, right? Go study anywhere you want. We only ask for two things, give up your religion, because we are atheists, we are against religion anyway, and give up your Zionism. Don't, you know, give up this whole belief that Jews are have nationalist aspirations, certainly the Jews might build their own state in Palestine. And so the Jews who joined the Bolsheviks and the, the communists, as they become known um, at some point after the revolution, actually do benefit from everything that's promised to them. Uh, you know, they, they and, and kind of, at the expense of essentially assimilating into the Soviet uh, into the Soviet life, but Jews who uh, but they experienced for the first decade they experienced more or less probably equality for the first time in their lives, but Jews who refused to give up their religion and who refused to give up Zionism are persecuted. Okay, so so but then you know we get to and I'm skipping through things very quickly here. But at some, when Stalin comes to power, things begin to shift um, under Stalin already during World War II and then certainly after World War II. Uh, the Zionism that Stalin preaches, or anti-Zionism rather, that Stalin preaches and practices, uh, acquires very clear conspiracy note, notes. So the early anti-Zionism of the Bolsheviks was grounded in theory. I mean, it was 
biased, you know, it was distorted. Like their arguments, I disagree with their arguments when I look at them, but I see the logic of their arguments. I can understand the logic. I can see where they're coming from. Agree or disagree, their arguments. When you get to late Stalin in particular, um, you start to see the kind of the rebirth of conspiracy thinking. And Stalin, of course, was famously paranoid, right? Um, and it, it expresses itself in the post-war repression against Jews. And I'm not going to dwell too much in it. This is one thing that one period of uh, one period of the Soviet Jewish history that's actually really, really well studied. But this is when you have in the late 1940s the anti uh, the the um, ruthless cosmopolitan campaign when Jews are accused of being in fifth column. Uh, and uh, and are viewed as not being loyal to um, to the country and to the leadership. And this is when you have the doctor's plot. And I'm going to share again. I want to show you a cartoon. So let me see. OK, this is Stalin. I'm sure everybody knows what he looks like. Uh, these are, this is, the, I just wanted to show this, you know, of course, Stalin, this is important to say that Stalin, of course, supported the establishment of the state of Israel, but it was a very brief, brief moment um, in Soviet history. And he didn't support the establishment of Israel because he suddenly became Zionist. It was because Israel was very much, there were portions of the Israeli society that were very uh, pro-Soviet, pro-Stalin. You can see this is from a, uh, from a parade, I think in Tel Aviv or in Israel at some point in the 40s. Uh, these are some of the brochures that Israelis put out. So, and Stalin also hoped that Israel, because of this, that Israel would become sort of a foothold for the USSR in fighting British imperialism in the Middle East. And that, of course, changes very quickly. Ben-Gurion changes his, um, or, or he never really was pro-Soviet. Ben-Gurion makes clear very quickly that Israel is going to follow, uh, is going to orient itself to the United States, to the West. And so Stalin's sentiment changes. He's also He also becomes paranoid because Soviet Jews are really excited about the Israeli state. And that's when kind of the idea that there is a fifth column um, appears in his mind, in his thinking. Um, this is Golda Meir coming to Moscow in 1948, uh, I believe. It's a really important uh, incident. You know, you can see that this is, she's surrounded by a sea of Soviet Jews, and this, this is part of the Soviet leadership understanding that, wow, Soviet Jews are really supporting Israel. Okay, but this is the cartoon that I wanted to show you. Uh, this cartoon appears at the time of the doctor's plot, when a group of Soviet Jews Soviet Jewish doctors are accused of, um, of uh, plotting against uh, the Kremlin leadership. And they're accused of being, um, you know what I'm just, I'm wondering if you can see the entire slide because on my screen for some reason, I can't see the whole thing. Okay. Um, so, so you can see here, you know, a kind of a, a hand of an honest, um, worker is throwing away this doctor you know the doctor is unmasked like the mask of a good doctor is uh is being thrown off his face and be behind it it's really you know that there are codes here visual codes like this three-piece suit is a code for a bourgeois or capitalist so behind the mask of a good doctor who is treating uh dear comrades in the kremlin is actually an ugly uh uh capitalist you know with with like this bloody fingers, you know, who wants to, who wants to murder. So, um, and in these post-war campaigns, one of the accusations that's present is the accusation of being an adherent to Zionism. It's called bourgeois nationalism then in the, in the terminology of that time, but the doctors are accused of being adherents to, to Zionism. And the same happened to Jewish uh, intelligentsia that was uh, murdered already even before that. Okay. So, so Stalin dies in 1953. This campaign goes uh, nowhere, thank God. And then there is sort of a period again. The you know the the state doesn't stop being anti-Zionist. Uh, it's just a little bit. I'm skipping through it because it's it's perhaps less. There are things happening, but but 67 is really when um, things turn. And this is 67 is 
um, is the time when Soviet anti-Zionism goes global. And I would say it's also the time when it really goes fully conspiracist. So it's it's Stalin, Stalin's times, it's, it's just kind of percolating. But after 67, the Soviets really, really develop uh, that anti-Zionist conspiracy theory, which is based on the same ideas of the anti-Semitic conspiracy theory that I showed you at the beginning, the, the slide with the uh, from the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, but they're now taking those ideas and talking about Zionists and not Jews, okay? And so 67 is a turning point because in June of 67, of course, Israel um, defeats Soviet Arab allies, and this was completely unexpected for the Soviets. It was a massive, um, it was just a, a massive crisis, a great and massive crisis in Moscow. Uh, it, it creates, uh, it gives the Soviets a, a sense that they are losing hold uh, at a very important um, part of the world. Uh, they don't understand how it is that a small, tiny state of Israel defeated the uh, states that the USSR supported and financed and trained as it did with the Arab states. And this is when, you know, the famous uh, conspiracist mind begins to work. And Soviet political culture was always paranoid anyway, had very strong paranoid streaks. And this is only just 15 years, really, after Stalin's death. Um, and, you know, barely a decade after his crimes are revealed. And so the Soviets begin to come to con the conclusion, you know, who are the Soviets? So the KGB, the various branches of Soviet intelligence, Soviet Soviet state security um, organs, um, the propaganda agencies, uh, the various party, uh, the various agencies of the party apparatus. So they sort of coalesce around the view that, in fact, Israel wasn't just, there's more to Israel than meets the eye, that Behind it stands the United States. Otherwise, how could such a small country win uh, against this powerful coalition of Arab armies supported by the USSR? And by the way, the United States did not support Israel in 1967. Um, and they, because the Soviets are also used to looking at everything through the ideological lens, they begin to look very closely at the ideology of Zionism. And again, it's not the first time they're doing it. They, they have studied it before. The KGB has looked at it carefully before. But now they really begin to elaborate very complex theories about Zionism being kind of this all-powerful uh, ideology that's present everywhere, that controls everything. So they begin to look abroad. And they see all these Jewish organizations, all these American Jewish organizations. They are all pro-Israel. And, they, and there are so many Jews everywhere. There are Jews in Congress. And there are Jews in the media. And there are Jews in, uh, you know, in the White House. Maybe, I don't know, in the White House. There were Jews at the time. But maybe there were. Uh, but, but there are Jews everywhere, right? And there are Jews in the banks, certainly. Um, and they start to say, well, look. Obviously, Zionists are in control of all of it. You know why they're projecting? They're projecting because they, this is how they run their world. But yes, of course, look, the World Zionist Organization runs all of these Jewish organizations up to like the smallest synagogue. They're all foot soldiers in the Zionist game. Uh, all of these Jews who are in the banks, they're Zionists. And so, of course, they direct all of this money to support the state of Israel. And then they see another thing. They see that 1967, Israel's victory had really inspired Soviet Jews. And Soviet Jews, after the freeze and terror of the post-war post years, are beginning to wake up to the meaning of their identity, they're beginning to wake up to the, the, the notion that, wow, look, you know, for the first time, they see something positive about being Jewish, that, look, there is a Jewish state that has delivered such a massive blow to so many, you know, to massive armies, and they get really inspired, and they want to learn Hebrew, and they want to understand more about Jewish history and Israeli history and religion, and they can't do it. They're prohibited. It's not allowed, because what's happening after Stalin is that the state sort of stops fighting Jews explicitly, but it kind of embarks on this course of gradual creeping assimilation, sort of like it, the less we talk about them, the quicker they will assimilate. Well, 67 is a point at which Soviet Jews 
refuse to continue assimilating or a large portion of them continues. And so this is where the refusenik struggle begins and, and, and American Jews, there's a campaign uh, by American Jews and Jews elsewhere, everywhere really around the globe in support of Soviet Jewry. And this too, the Soviets begin to see through this conspiracist lens. They think, well, this is all Zionist machinations, the same world Zionist organization and all of its foot soldiers, they are trying to undermine our country from within by inspiring immigration. And so, and so the whole big, this massive campaign develops targeting Zionism and targeting Israel. So I want to show you some slides here. So this campaign produced just an unbelievable amount of literature to begin with, okay? Hundreds of books. These are all in Russian, but many of them were translated into numerous languages, English and French and Spanish and Arabic. Um, so uh, the, the hundreds of these books were produced with the, with the help of the Soviet Academy. Here are some examples of the English language books. These, these are brochures, kind of like the one that I showed you at the beginning. So again, just a fraction of what was produced, and again, only in English. You know, Novosti, the same organization that published uh, the Zionism Counts on Terror that I showed you, the foreign propaganda arm, translated them into every language under the sun. So something like this you would have, again, in French and in Arabic and in Spanish and various African um, languages and Hindu and uh, uh, every, you know, every language that the Soviets wanted, if, if the Soviets wanted that country to take on these ideas and they would produce uh, literature uh, in that language. Um, this, these are some slides from the campaign in Poland. So the same idea, you can see there is a poster in the end, in the back rather, which says, Basically, Zionist dirt. There's a guy with a um, with a uh, broom clearing out uh, Zionist dirt. So that was a massive um, campaign organized by the state in 1968 with inspiration from Moscow. Here's another slide from that. Um, and so, so what were some of the messages of this campaign? So here, I, I have a comparison between the protocols of the elders of Zion and what Soviet propaganda said. I mean, the comparisons are really very direct, you know, so the protocols talked about the danger of international Jewry that wants to control the world. Soviet propaganda talked about international Zionists, international Zionism. You know, the protocols talked about Jews controlling global media and world politics and manipulating world events behind the scenes and indoctrinating the youth with poisonous ideas. And Soviet propaganda said the same about Zionists. Zionists control the world, Zionists control global affairs, Zionists indoctrinate, manipulate, etc. And this is something that you see today um, in various uh, in various forms. So I, I wrote an essay just before, I, it was published right before um, October 7th called The Cult of Zionism or Cult of Zionism uh, in Tablet. And so I described there the ideas that um, that we see expressed by the so-called Institute of uh, for the Critical Study of Zionism. And you see this kind of conspiracy thinking there, like Zionists are everywhere. Zionists are... You know, they control what American police does and they they somehow yeah, they just, like they're everywhere. You have to see it to really understand what they're, they're, they're in the in Central America and they're in India and they are they undermine things everywhere. They undermine everything that the left wants to achieve. Zionists are there to undermine it. OK, this is a direct kind of descendant of Soviet thinking. The Soviets used to say that Zionists are anti-communist. They are anti-socialist, they hate the USSR, they hate progressive people, and this is really what we're seeing today. Um, okay, let me see before I get uh, into some specific comparisons, if I've said everything that I wanted to say here as a fundamental. Well, yeah, so let me just say a couple more things. I mentioned books and brochures, but also, you know, the Soviets produced, I mean, this is an example, it's, it's, it's in Russian, actually, so in Russian and English. So this is an example of a Soviet theoretical journal called The Problems of Peace and Socialism. It was translated into 26 languages. The journal that was produced in English, the World, um, I actually can't see it here, the World Marxist Review, it was published in Canada. 
and it's an exact translation. There's some really outrageous uh, articles there about Zionism. And this this was this was um, a journal that kind of signaled to the entire international communist movement what to think about about various important issues. And so if you wanted to know what to think about Zionism, you would turn to this. So this is just one example. And they distributed this journal in 146 countries. And so there were just countless, countless uh, magazines and journals that the Soviets produced. They also financed a lot of left-wing media, far-left media, certainly communist uh, publications, you know, in the U.S., just everywhere, you know, they, they financed uh, communist publications, which at this time all begin to publish anti-Zionist articles along the very same lines that Soviet internal propaganda publishes. You know, there are radio broadcasts. Soviet embassies begin to work to propagate these ideas. There are records of Soviet embassies, in fact, working to instill these ideas among the local populations and local elites. Um, there are international conferences that the Soviets organize. There are front organizations. Uh, there are various symposia. And it's interesting is that whatever the Soviets organize, you know, they, like let's say they organize a, symposi a symposium in support of, you know, South Africa, for example. And the symposium would adopt a resolution, which is all about South Africa's struggle, but then it would also end with and you know, we fight against uh, imperialism and reaction, world reaction and Zionism, or imperialism, Zionism and world reaction. This is how it would go. So they would keep associating Zionism with every evil. You know, or let's say the women, some kind of a women's communist organization holds a symposium and they would adopt a resolution and it would be the same. Like at the end, they would all, you know, we're fighting the discrimination against women and we're also fighting Zionism. So because the, so you know, the USSR was so centralized, they were able to really control the message and to ensure you know that the message of this ideological campaign and this ideological campaign was a top priority for Soviet leadership we know it from the memoranda that have been declassified um that they uh that they could insert the key messages uh, about Zionism into everything that they produced okay so one of the things that I want us to look at specifically is this equation between Zionists and Nazis because it underlies everything right whenever uh when when um people make this equation it's it's probably one of the most popular um uh, slogans or variations on the slogans uh are the most popular ones at various anti-israel demonstrations to equate Zionists with Nazis or Israel with Nazi Germany is to basically say that Zionists are conducting, uh, Israel is conducting a genocide against the Palestinian people. And so I want to look closely at this. Uh, I want to also look at it because it actually, it recently appeared in the New Yorker. Uh, some of you may have read an article written by Marsha Gessen in the shadow of the Holocaust. Uh, this article, I mean, it's pretty shocking, you know, some, some uh, really, you know, some barriers are being broken in terms of uh, what's, what, what should and can be acceptable in, uh, in society, in mainstream uh, discourse. You know, when the New Yorker published an article which equates uh, Gaza with a Jewish ghetto and basically says that what Israelis are doing in Gaza is liquidating the ghetto, We've really crossed some boundaries. And what was really interesting is that Masha Gessen, who is a celebrated journalist, uh, in subsequent uh, podcasts, uh, expressed the, the view that actually it was uh, Gessen's idea that nobody before that made this comparison, compared Gaza with a Jewish ghetto. And that's, of course, completely incorrect. The Soviets actually uh, pioneered the use of this comparison for mass propaganda. Others have made the equation between Zionists and Nazis. They made it before the Soviets started to deploy it massively in propaganda. But again, for mass propaganda, the Soviets really pioneered this and really inculcated it among massive uh, audiences. So let's just look at a few pictures here before we uh, proceed. So just as an example, I'm sure you've seen uh, this uh, intertwining of the swastika with the Star of David. So this has been, so the picture on the left is from the stand of the Communist Party of Great Britain uh, from a cover of its brochure. I'll have another uh, look at it uh, in a moment. You know, this flag appears, it's, it's been around forever. Uh, the Israeli flag 
with blood stains and this intertwining. The picture on the right is also from one of the London demonstrations. Israel is a bastard state, and you have this uh, this flag there. Uh, this is the cover of the brochure, uh, which says Zionism, a racist, anti-Semitic, and reactionary tool of imperialism. So this, this language is completely Soviet. It's completely Soviet language. And it appears today on a brochure of the Communist Party of Great Britain, which it displays at the demonstrations uh, in London. Here's what I want to, so here's, I, I want to show you a few comparative slides. Okay, so on the right, it's again, London demonstrations. But on the left, look at this. You have the banner of the Zionist gang. This, is, uh, this was published in a Soviet newspaper in 1971. So you see already back then, the Soviets were making this comparison by intertwining the Star of David and the swastika. Here's another one. Um, you, the, on the left, you have two cartoons from Soviet uh, newspapers. On the left, you see an Israeli uh, soldier dreaming of Hitler, right? The Hitler inside the Star of David. Uh, and a picture of destruction in the back, right? This is, it, it's already, you can see that the Soviets are, the Soviet cartoonists from 1972 are trying to tell you that the Israelis are creating the kind of destruction that the Nazis created uh, in the, you know, in the Jewish ghettos on, or in the uh, camps, in the death camps. The next picture to it, you see the, the next the one, the one next to it uh, shows you a direct comparison between an Israeli uh, soldier and a Nazi soldier. And again, in the back, in the background, you see this comparison, right? Just, just so just to tell the somebody here from the New Yorker is listening to this. I just want to tell you, like, you're not, you're not that original. You see, like the Soviets are really making that comparison that what Israelis are doing is the same kind of destruction, liquidation of the ghetto. Uh, that the Nazis did, and this is 1970s. Um, the cartoon on the right is a contemporary um, uh, cartoon, uh, Panzer's Gaza by Carlos Latouf, uh, 2009. I mean, relatively compared, uh, uh, relatively um, contemporary, but you know, it's it's the kind of imagery you will still see. It. Carlos Latouf is very well known for his anti-Israel cartoons. Very direct comparison between Nazi Germany and um, and Israel and a Palestinian girl wearing the striped pajamas associated with Auschwitz, uh, the Israeli tank leaving a shadow and an imprint of, um, of the swastika. So again, very kind of long, long uh, existing comparisons. Uh, here's another one. You see the Soviet cartoon on the left where, and this is actually, it's one mistake where the Soviets forgot that they needed to talk about Zionists and Israelis instead of Jews. You know, usually in Soviet cartoons, you will see some indication that they're talking about Zionists, even if only in the, in the language, like we saw in that first cartoon with a spider, right? Um, but here, there are actually no indications that they're talking about Zionists. This is, this is a Jew with a blood, blood dripping um, uh, axe, right, with the Star of David on it even with a horn, deeply classical anti-Semitic image. And the shadow, of course, is Hitler. The image in the middle comes from the Holocaust, uh, uh, Iran's Holocaust cartoon context. So a Jew looking in the mirror sees Hitler. And here on the right, we see again from a, some of the recent demonstrations in London, I believe, where there was a comparison between Netanyahu and Hitler. There are lots and lots of these that have appeared over the last few months since October 7th. Here's another example. What you see on the left is the cover of a book uh, by Mahmoud Abbas, which he based on his Soviet dissertation, which he defended in 1982. So again, to show you how far these comparisons go, his dissertation, in his dissertation, he essentially equates Zionism with Nazism. He talks about the supposed collaboration between Nazism and Zionism. I have a whole article about that if you're interested in tablet. It's it's actually a pretty fascinating story um, of, of that dissertation. And on the right is, again, this is from London, Zionism is the new Nazism. At the top, it's, it's just a placard that I think one of the most popular ones that we see. Here are a few more examples. Netanyahu, Hitler would be proud. Uh, stop doing what Hitler did to you. So these are, you know, again, the Soviets, I was just actually looking at some uh, articles from 1967 in the Soviet, in Soviet produced English language press. And so they already talk there about, you know, Jews need to stop. Jews are doing what Hitler did to them, you know, so this is how far it goes. Um, 
you know, we'll, we'll skip through this. It's the same idea. Um, well, I'll just say a couple of words. I mean, basically, you have an Israeli soldier who is receiving a blueprint of Auschwitz from a Nazi ghost. Um, and in the back, you have, again, it's kind of a, a, a you know, a, uh, I think, a hint at the destruction of a ghetto. There is a wall, right? So, and on the right, it's very clear. It's a very simple image. It's obvious that, you know, Israelis are building Auschwitz around um, Temple Mount. Okay, uh, just a few examples, contemporary, you know, again, that kind of Soviet uh, tool of an Israeli looking in the mirror and seeing um, a Nazi in the Palestinian is equated with a Jew. Um, here's another one. So, so what is the problem with these images? So the problem with these images, this tool is called Holocaust inversion, okay? The Holocaust inversion is when you take uh, is when you invert the Holocaust and Jews became Nazis and the Palestinians become Jews. And, you know, if you read Deborah Lipstadt, she at some point uh, said in an interview that this, that Holocaust inversion is really, she calls it a worm of soft core denial. It's a form, a soft, it's a soft, soft core form of Holocaust denial because it, inflates by a factor of zillion uh, what, uh, the, what Israelis did and diminishes by the same factor what the Nazis did. And so now, today, in the post-October 7th world, we have the New Yorker, the, the kind of, you know, the highest brow magazine that we have in America, arguably, or had maybe in the past, uh, washing Holocaust inversion through its distinguished pages. So this is this is where we are. Um, okay, these are just a few um, a few contemporary uh, pictures. But okay, so so you know, having said that, uh, progressives really repeat Soviet propaganda with extraordinary accuracy. I want to say also that there is one way in which they have outpaced the KGB. And they have outpaced it by, uh, with their slogan, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. That slogan, um, okay, I think I'm done, so I'm going to stop sharing. So that slogan is a new invention. I don't know its origins, but it's certainly, it's not present in Soviet literature. And what's remarkable about it is that the Soviets were always very careful uh, to say that Israel had a right to exist. And I think they did it for a variety of reasons. You know, they understood that if they denied that Israel had a right to exist, they would first of all play into Israel's own fears. They would also uh, sound like Nazis, frankly. You know, they remembered that they voted, Stalin voted for the creation of the state of Israel. And so there was a big measure of hypocrisy here because the Soviets, of course, financed Israel's genocidal enemies. But outwardly, they always said that Israel, of course, absolutely has a right to exist. And everything that we're saying and doing, it has nothing to do with Israel, eliminating Israel. Israel exists and has a right to exist. And um, uh Yes, so Israel has a right to exist. Uh, but what they called for was the, not for the elimination of Israel, but for an Israel without Zionism. So today we have progressives who are obviously no longer afraid to look like Nazis, and they are calling for the elimination of Israel. I mean, that's 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 really striking. Okay, so in conclusion, um, I want to say this. So somebody asked me recently, does it really matter? Like, does it really matter that progressives are reproducing Soviet agit prop, right? Maybe it's okay. You know, the Soviet Union doesn't exist anymore. And if these are effective slogans to attack the bad actor Israel with, then maybe it's all right. What, what harm does it do? Well, I think it does do harm. It does do harm because... First of all, we're dealing with totalitarian propaganda that was created to undermine the free world. And, you know, this propaganda has a very heavy history attached to it. So just like, you know, in my recent Quillette piece, I talked about, I quote a British scholar, Kassam, who talks about how, you know, ideas have a history of their own. 
So if a white Southerner, for example, wanted to display a Confederate flag on her porch and said that, well, I'm not doing it in support of slavery, I'm just doing it because I want to honor my Southern heritage, I think all of us will very quickly understand that it doesn't work that way, right? A flag, a Confederate flag symbolizes what it symbolizes. And you can't just at will detach that, that the meaning, the, the symbol and the history of that, of what it symbolizes from the symbol. It just doesn't work that way. And it's the same with this kind of propaganda that we are hearing today, which I have to say for me and for my friends and acquaintances, those of us who come from the US societies, absolutely shocking to hear this because we thought we left it all behind and here it is right this is propaganda that was produced by anti-semites who really believed uh that jews were dangerous and needed to be eliminated uh it was produced in order to to meet the needs foreign policy needs and domestic policy needs of a totalitarian state and uh you know when this propaganda was launched, when this propaganda campaign was launched, Jews felt in the USSR felt the impact right away. Uh, very soon, they began to leave. The, the, there was enough pressure put on and like a couple hundred thousand Jews left in the 1970s. Then the entry e exits were closed. But then in the late 80s, once they opened again, a million Jews left the country. So Anti-Zionism, once it's adopted by a state or by a culture, is actually incompatible with Jewish life. It's something that Einat Wilf talks about on a more general, in a more general way. It's it, she says it's and, and it, she's completely correct that it's any society and every society, Arab states, right? The USSR, once they adopted this kind of anti-Zionist stance, it became incompatible with Jewish life. And this very well may happen today. I think that the pressure that a lot of Jews are feeling in the US certainly uh, leads one to that conclusion. Uh, I think the fact that we have this propaganda now, now let me clarify, I don't think I made it clear. So, so I think, the, what my understanding of it and my sense of it is that these ideas got inculcated on the global left in the 70s and 80s. You see a lot of left wing publications in the 70s and 80s republishing these things and advocating these things. And this kind of Palestinian cause in this very distorted way became a part and parcel of a left wing view in, the, in this particular conspiracist expression. And so, uh, but and it lived on the fringes for all these years, but because the fringes are now coming into the mainstream, we're hearing it uh, much more. But also, of course, right now, after October 7th, you know, there are, I'm convinced that there, I don't track it, but I'm convinced that there are state actors who are also bumping up uh, these ideas. We know that the Chinese are doing it. Uh, certainly, Iran is doing it. Uh, and again, these ideas, look, these Soviet brochures, they're floating on the internet. I've just seen a left-wing um, American website republish an article that was written by a member of the Communist Party of the USA, so they present it as such. But in fact, I know for a fact that he, this person went to Moscow to, to learn from Moscow. There, there's a memo about it where he goes to Moscow in order to learn from the Soviets uh, what Zionism is and how it works. And he goes and publish a book, publishes a book based on that. And so, so you know, so this is, so he, here's this left-wing website, essentially republishing for today's generation ideas that come straight from Moscow. So this is, you know, there are multiple channels of influence up to now. So I think that, look, pro progressives have every right to reproduce KGB propaganda, you know, freedom of speech and all that, you know, but, but, you know, they, they shouldn't be surprised. We need to know enough to point it out to them and to tell them that we won't accept it in the same way that we won't accept uh, the penetration of anti-Jewish Nazi propaganda into our political discourse. I see this as absolutely equivalent. So I think I will stop here and I'll be happy to answer any questions that people may have. <clears throat> this, is, this is really fabulous, Isabella. Thank you so much. Um, I'm Barbara Windham. I'm a member of the Beth Am Je Je uh, Jewish and Israel Advocacy Committee, and I'll be moderating the Q&A today with Isabella. Uh, if you have a question that you'd like her to answer, please click on the Q&A icon and type your question into the box. Uh, many have already been typed in, and we will uh, get to as many as we can. More, obviously, still welcome. 
Uh, so Isabella, let's start here. Uh, you touched on this a little bit, um, but if the Soviet Union was always anti-Zionist, why did Stalin support and allow the United Nations approval of the creation of the State of Israel in 1948? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I touched on it very briefly. I think in 1948, uh, Stalin believed, or 47, I think it is, uh, Stalin believed that uh, Israel could become a foothold for the USSR and for the global revolution, like for spreading global revolution, socialist revolution, and Soviet influence into the Middle East, because there was a lot of socialist, um, uh, so socialist, Soviet, and really Stalinist sentiments actually among the Israeli kibbutzniks. Um, so he had reasons to believe that, uh, but that that turned very that changed around very quickly. He was just he was just sure that this would be an influence uh, that would be beneficial uh, for for the uh, USSR, and that's that's not what happened. Got it. So this one may sound naive, but it's it's actually a really good question. Why do lies and conspiracy theories often exist long after they're proven false? Well, that's yeah, that's a really excellent question. <laughs> I mean, I think it, it's very, you know, it's very true that conspiracy theorists are uh, impervious to factual arguments. You know, whatever factual arguments you bring to a conspiracy theorist, somebody who believes into a, in a conspiracy theory, they will just incorporate it into their theory. You know, you know, it could be very simple, such as, oh, sure, like what we hear on social media all the time, oh, this is just Hasbara, right? So if they believe that Hamas did not commit the atrocities and that we invented all of the accusations of rape, then anything else you say, they will just work it into it. And they will say, well, that's just, you know, that's just more, this is just proof that Zionist propaganda is working over time. There is something about a conspiracist worldview that is self-sealing. You know, it's impenetrable. Once you're in that world, you can no longer accept anything that's outside of it. And why that is, I think that there are psychological explanations. There are all kind, there are various explanations that people use. Um, certainly for some people, it's a question of their political agenda. Uh, conspiracy theory is very much political propaganda and it serves political purposes. Um, but I think for other people, it's just that the conspiracy theory um, give such a perfect explanation, such an easy uh, to comprehend explanation to very complex phenomena in the world that they just can't give it up. It's a shame though. Um, so it's one a point, great that, shame. One point mm. that somebody brought up is that, um, that, uh, that, that the socialist Jewish parties associated with Bolsheviks um, or anti-Zionists, uh, anti much like liberal Jewish people and organizations in the U.S. today. So they're sort of associating the Socialist Jewish Party. Um, let me see. Oh, okay. So, so can you can you connect the Socialist Jewish Party's association with the, the Bolsheviks, um, who are anti-Zionists, the same way liberal Jewish people and organizations in the USA are today. So they're basically saying, do you see similarities? And can you elaborate on this, please? You know, there may be similarities, you know, especially if we're talking today about, uh, I would say maybe it's not lib, I mean, I don't know, all of these, this terminology is really confused and mixed up right now, but there's certainly a group of, um, you know, Jewish socialists today who, uh, link themselves to the Bund, you know, the the Jewish Bund, the of the Soviet era or the revolutionary era. But you know, this comparison falls apart uh, at the point where you you have to understand that Bund, the Bund existed, the social, the uh, Jewish socialists uh, at the time were arguing against Zionism before the Holocaust, they were arguing against Zionism when Zionism hadn't yet proven itself. It hadn't yet proven that it is capable of saving Jewish lives. And so at that point, that discussion is very valid, right? This is something, Zionism is still very abstract. It still hasn't, the state is not established. It's completely valid to argue against it. Today, we're essentially talking about unbirthing a state. Right when we're talking about being against Zionism today, and being and today Zionism is really understood as as 
you know, being in, in, in supporting the right of Israel to exist. So people who oppose it are essentially saying that we need to undo the state. And that is a very different proposition, right? It's an ethnic cleansing proposition, actually. And so that I would say that that's the biggest difference that people need to understand. So in a related question, a uh, person asks, uh, several of the translated books, which you um, were showing on the screen, uh, they, 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 they observed that they, or they thought they observed, that several of them seem to have Jewish authors like Bernstein or Brodsky. Can you comment on this? A very excellent observation. So, so the Soviet anti-Zionist campaigns always used Jews uh, very actively. Um, they understood, the Soviets always understood that Jewish authors and Jewish speakers sound much more convincing when they condemn Zionism, when they condemn, condemn Israel. So there was a, the authors, authors of the books, first of all, I'm convinced that some of them are pseudonyms because some, they, they just don't appear um, anywhere else. And we know of some cases where uh, somebody who was not Jewish was very active, prolific, anti-Zionist, uh, conspiracist, anti-Semitic, really like anti-Semitic writer, used Jewish uh, pseudonyms uh, in order to create credibility for himself. Uh, but there were bona fide Jewish intellectuals, Jewish uh, intellectuals, maybe not, uh, well, okay, Jew Jewish academics, uh, Jewish uh, artists, um, who were regularly used in the campaign to speak and condemn Zionism, especially with foreign audiences. And, you know, uh, yes, yes, that, that existed. I think that uh, my uh, sort of, I'm looking into that now. I think that some of the people who participated in this campaign did not have a choice. I mean, 70s and 80s is not uh, Stalin's time. They probably wouldn't have been sent to the Gulag. You know, they wouldn't have been executed for, for you know, for refusing to obey the state's order to participate in this campaign. But they would have lost some, a lot of privileges. I mean, we're talking about people who had high-profile careers. They had benefits like being able to travel abroad, which is something that ordinary Soviet citizens didn't have. And I can imagine that for many Soviet Jews at the time, Zionism was really too uh, abstract because, you know, Soviet Jews really didn't know much. You know, they, we really didn't. You know, we were, remember, we were surrounded by the Iron Curtain. Uh, you had to be part of the underground and you had to be reading some of self-publishing documents, uh, self-publishing uh, magazines and journals, which was illegal in order to really understand and know. And I can imagine that some of these people thought, well, I don't know what Zionism is, you know, but here and now, this is what's important for me. So, so it's a, it's a complex, it's a complex issue, but yes, absolutely, Jews were a part of this. Well, it's interesting because it has parallels today, of course, when you think about trotting out the Jewish voice for peace speaker, they're, they're, they're like a handful of people who come out all the time. And anyway. Exactly. Well, and I think that today, you know, it's interesting because of course, today, you could say that, you know, nobody is forcing them. Like there isn't the KGB that forces them. There isn't, you know, they, there is really nothing. There, there, could, there would be no heavy consequences for, for them if they don't participate in this. They do it because they truly believe in this. Uh, and, and fine, you know, I, I would also say, however, that there are a lot of social benefits to taking this position. Uh, and there are a lot of you, you lose a lot by changing your, your mind and actually standing with Israel. I think today it's much, much harder to stand with Israel than to come out and to accuse it. And certainly those who want Israel eliminated are happy, very happy to use Jews uh, to support their agendas, just like the Soviets did in the 70s and 80s. So why would the Soviet Union expend so much energy on such a tiny minority? I mean, why did the Jews even matter? Well, it's such a great question. Um, I mean, I think that it's really, they, they truly believed what they preached. They really believed that Zionism was all powerful. You know, you read these books and it's like these recitations you know, my favorite part is the recitations of, of all the, you know, they did a good job studying the Jewish com American Jewish community. Um, like they had the numbers, you know, about how many synagogues there are. I mentioned it, you know, what, what kind of congresses they had. You know, every time there was a Zionist, uh, the, the Zionist um, 
World Zionist Organization held a congress, there would be like jitters in Moscow because they thought that these are really like the elders of Zion planning, uh, planning like how they're going to control the world. You know, I really think that they believed in what they preached. They believed that there was a Zionist conspiracy, just like anti-Semites believe that there is an anti-Semitic conspiracy against the against them. So, uh, and they they did believe that it it harmed uh, it and could seriously harm, and in fact did harm their uh, political interests around the globe. Uh, they thought that Zionist Jews, uh, by arguing, um, you know, by, uh, by lobbying on behalf of Soviet Jews, were in fact preventing the Soviets from establishing better relations with the with the US with the with Washington. So they felt that this was a hostile lobby, anti-Soviet lobby. So you know it's a lot of it's it's just it's it's amazing what conspiracy theory can do to your mind. So there have been a number of questions about this and I'm going to try and pull them together. Um, the idea is that, that this misinformation or disinformation or propaganda, whatever you want to call it, has been going on for a long time. So why aren't we fighting this better, this campaign now, and when, how can we fight it? Well, why we're not fighting, I don't know. You know, I mean, frankly, I've been screaming about this since, you know, I think I think about, I posted my first article in 2018, and it was very hard, uh, or published my first article on this in 2018. You know, for there were a few years when it was really hard to convince uh, people in the U.S., in the Jewish communities in particular, that anti-Semitism uh, that came in this form was dangerous. If you remember, we were all, uh, you know, occupied arguing which anti-Semitism is worse, which anti-Semitism is more dangerous, on the left or on the right? You know, and the answer was always, well, on the right, because they're, they're armed, you know, and they are, and of course, it is, it's, I think in, in the United States, Jews were have always been conditioned really to look to the right as a source of danger, completely understandably, and it's correct. It's just that it's only partial. You know, for those of us who come from socialist countries, you know, we really understand it from through the history of our own families and our own personal histories, how dangerous left-wing anti-Semitism is. But it was very hard to convince people that that was the case. And so we missed a lot of opportunities, you know, and, and the, and the anti-Israel left was prepared. They never stopped for a moment. And so I think that a lot of people are understanding this now after October 7th. It's becoming a lot clearer for a lot of people, uh, mm -hmm. but we are behind in a lot of ways. Um, and, and well, how do we do it? Uh, look, I mean, you know, propaganda is is notoriously hard to fight, you know, especially propaganda that, that received such massive infusions of state resources. You know, what are you going to do? Invent your own? Uh, like, like it's, you just, you can't, you know, and, and truth never sounds as exciting as propaganda, unfortunately. You know, uh, propaganda hits you on an emotional level. This, this was, this is how they worked. Uh, I think that our only weapon, and it's a long-term weapon, there are, there are no shortcuts here. We're never going to win just by financing, or by, by sorry, by uh, refining or finessing our uh, talking points. Uh, the answer is education. We have to be educating ourselves and our children from early age. They need to understand. I mean, American Jews are very good. Uh, I'm an American Jew, by the way, too, you know, so I, I, I'm just like native born, I would say, maybe uh, American Jews who grew up in the in in the US, um, you know, I think understand very well kind of the contours of the history of Nazi Germany and Nazi German anti-Semitism. Well, we need to develop at least a similar understanding and insights into Soviet history and Soviet anti-Semitism. And that means developing new courses and developing new uh, new ways to teach it. I don't see any other way. You know, we the only way to not let propaganda affect you is to know, uh, is to know it, to recognize it, and to kind of to 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 have enough critical thinking to be able to um to kind of reflect it away from you. Uh, I don't have short-term solutions, I'm sorry to say. Uh, so, so am I, and so is everybody on this call, I'm afraid. Um, but so there, there's a related question here that I'm just gonna pull up. Um, college students hear so much Soviet-based propaganda on campus, though many of them may not know that. If you were speaking to a group of Jewish college students about anti-Semitism and Zionism, 
what would you most want them to understand if you could boil it down? Well, I, I think I would say that this is the, the, the words that they're using and the terms that they're using, uh, the ideas that they're using were produced by uh, a repressive state that uh, oppressed uh, ethnic minorities, that uh, was highly illiberal, that um, that was uh, against every notion of freedom. I mean, I don't know if no, the notion of freedom resonates with today's students, but I think that's the point that I would make, you know, that, th that this emanates from a totalitarian state that oppressed its Jews uh, and lots of other minorities. And by repeating that, we're giving a boost to these ideas. You know, and I, I also always emphasize that criticism and demonization are not the same. And what this propaganda does is it demonizes, it doesn't criticize. And I think that we really need to, like we need to teach students, students need to understand the difference between demonization and criticism because Israel is criticized plenty. Jews criticize it, Israelis criticize it, and it's completely fine. You know, it's unpleasant for pro-Israel people to hear it, but it's completely fine. It's not anti-Semitic, but th there is one category of, of language and rhetoric and thinking that's conspiracist and, and, and demonizing. And this is what we need to avoid. So helping to separate out what, what's con conspiracy theorists and, and demonizing versus what's fair criticism. And that's, that's yeah. yeah. Exactly. Uh, I'm going to change course here for a minute. There's a question here that's um, it's a little different. It says, given your background in Soviet history and anti-Semitism, can you talk about the anti-Semitic ideology that dominated historically in the U Ukraine and whether it's changed in the current day? And if it is still there and it hasn't changed, then how did Zelensky get elected president? <laughs> You know that that kind of takes us off course. To be honest with you, I I think I, I want to um, um, I, I, I kind of want to skip this question. But let you know. Look, I mean, I'll say a couple of things. I think that um, I think that the uh, the fact that Zelensky got elected says something about the, the presence or absence of anti-Semitism in Ukraine. I mean, I really don't think that. Ukraine suffered from more anti-Semitism in recent years than your average European country. Uh, the fact that you know the, the election of Zelensky says says much about it. Um, you know, the, right now Russia is using uh, the accusations of anti-Semitism against Ukraine for propaganda purposes. I find the language that they use pretty uh, disturbing. Um, and I don't know. I'm sorry. I think I'm just gonna I'm just gonna skip this because only because you know I haven't followed it as closely uh, recently, and so I don't want to just I don't want to be inventing things. <laughs> that that's that's perfectly fair. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, there are lots more questions asking what can we do, um, but I, I we're not gonna have get a magic bullet, so I'm gonna skip some of those because you've already uh, uh, tried to do some of those. Um, it says, do you see a similarity um, with the way generations of Palestinian children have been taught that Israel is illegitimate and all the land is occupied? Do you see similarities between that and what the Soviet propaganda, historic propaganda has been? Well, I think that what Palestinian children are being taught is perhaps uh, more... Um, a, you know, I mean, my understanding is that it's uh, it, it's more actually radical, probably, than what the Soviets put out in their uh, in their literature. But I think that the influences are probably there because certainly, um, you know, there, there were very close ties between uh, various Palestinian groups and the USSR. Again, Mahmoud Abbas defended his dissertation in the Soviet Union using Soviet sources. You know, when you track the sources that he relied on, it's completely, it's all Soviet propaganda, essentially. Uh, Palestinian groups uh, trained in the USSR, you know, they underwent military training and the Soviets were always very um, uh, thorough in also giving propaganda training. So I'm sure that some of the language that uh, that's there probably comes from uh, from kind of Soviet thinking. But I also think that you probably have 
uh, a lot of kind of Arab um, anti-Semitic, anti-Zionist propaganda there as well. So I, I'm not an expert on Palestinian uh, textbooks, uh, but this is this is my sense. Now, you know, here's it's maybe an opportunity to say I think that you know this this Soviet what Soviet propagandists did. You know, they didn't claim necessarily originality of ideas, right? Sometimes they they borrowed ideas from other places. So, for example, we know of examples of Soviet propagandists borrowing ideas from, from Arab anti-Semitic propaganda. So one of the uh, well-known Zionologists, as they were called, so kind of this fake uh, four experts uh, on, on Zionism who produced a lot of this anti-Zionist literature, he was an Arabist by training. Actually, several of them were. So, and he served as an ambassador, Soviet ambassador in, or not an ambassador, in the embassy, uh, in Soviet embassy in, in Egypt, in Cairo, at the time when, uh, there was a, a, a an institute for anti-Israel propaganda that was run by a former Nazi then at, in Cairo. And so he picked up a few brochures from that from that institute and he quoted them. Or oh, he didn't quote them, he borrowed from them, but people traced the source of these borrowings to these brochures. So what am I saying is that Soviet propagandists might borrow from, you know, from, let's say, from Arab propaganda. They frankly borrowed a lot from Nazi propaganda as well, from Nazi anti-Semitic propaganda, of course, without attribution. You know, the equation between Zionists and Nazis, actually, Robert Wistridge, a great scholar of anti-Semitism, uh, saw the British Foreign Office, uh, people in the British Foreign Office make this uh, equation, I think, in the, already in the 1930s, you know, between the 19, before the before World War II. So, but here's the thing, you know, it's one thing if some, a couple of anti-Semites in the British Foreign Office make these comparisons between themselves and it stays in their documents. And it's one thing when, I don't know, I mean, Egypt had pretty powerful uh, propaganda machine, but I'm going to guess nothing compared to the Soviet propaganda machine. So it's it's one thing when, you know, Egypt uh, puts out a brochure and it remains wherever it remains. And it's completely different. It's a different thing when Soviet propaganda picks up these ideas and then broadcasts them to the entire world, right? 150 countries, dozens of languages, and repeats it over and over and over again and inculcates it via various means that I was discussing via different channels. So, uh, so I just want to be clear that you know, I think that it was a two-way street. Uh, you know, they often picked up what Western Jewish intellectuals published, anti-Zionist intellectuals published, and they would incorporate it into their brochures, and they would even quote them. A lot of times it was a distortion, it was decontextualized, but they, what they were really good at was at synthesizing things and then creating force multipliers to really, to just kind of boost these ideas and make them available to everyone. So... That's that. Sorry, I just made this jump uh, no, because it wasn't it's, opportunity. It's actually, it's actually really interesting and 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 helpful for all of us to understand. Mm -hmm. There's there's a very specific question about something happening locally here. Um, it says we're about to have a city council meeting at which anti-Israel protesters are likely to use a Holocaust memorial event to equate Israelis with Nazis, and they're going to repeat much of the propaganda that you cited in your talk today. So the questioner says, we will have a chance to speak briefly as well. What would be most important to say in our response? Well, I think the question is, who are you trying to convince? You know, who is your audience? I think that if you're trying to convince the people who are saying these things, it's probably a losing game. You know, are, are you, who are you trying, are you speaking to people who are moderates who may be listening to you, who are maybe, you know, the silent majority. I, I think that these are the people that we want to be speaking to. And if these are the people, because you, you will never convince the radicals. Uh, and I think it's a losing fight. I think the fight is really for the moderates, for the people who maybe are confused by the, the, the you know, it's a very confusing moment for someone who uh, is well-intentioned uh, but doesn't know, perhaps doesn't know much. I think, I, mean, the assumption, me, I think the assumption here, just to interrupt for a moment, the assumption here is that they're not going to convince the people who are spewing the propaganda. They want to be convincing the city council members who just don't know the history and don't know any better. So if what you want to do yeah. is counter the misinformation and help the, the, the city council people who truly do want to be doing the right thing, what can you say to well, best? Uh, look, I mean, you could go, um, 
you could, for example, do what I did in my Quillette piece, which is, you know, if you're going to be equating uh, Gaza with a Jewish ghetto, well, then let's look at that comparison. You know, um, Gaza was meant to be uh, a, a jewel on the Mediterranean, yeah, right? That once Israel left, the, an enormous amount of money flowed in. Um, they, everybody wanted it to succeed, but it elected Hamas. And Hamas used uh, all of the money for military assets. And look, Jews in the ghettos during World War II wish they would have had a fraction of the weapons that the IDF is discovering in, in Gaza, right? Jews in the ghettos did not rape or assault German women, right? It's a completely invalid comparison. They didn't have money flowing into the ghettos. Nobody wanted the ghettos to become jewels of Poland. Right. Nobody wanted for uh, for Jews to prosper. I mean, Jews were there to be annihilated. Uh, it's something completely different from what we have in Gaza. So you could look carefully at that comparison and and make it. You know, you could also say that you know that, that this is a Holocaust inversion, which is really a form of Holocaust denial, and that these people who claim to be left are in fact standing uh, shoulder to shoulder with the Holocaust denials, denialists on the far right. I don't know if this will be convincing to your council members, but these are some of the things that come up for me. I know that for me, this would be things that I would pay attention. Thank you. So Putin now supports Iran um, and Iran wants to destroy Israel. So do you think that Russia's goal is the complete elimination of Israel at this point? And then the second part of that question is Hamas visited Russia. So are they completely allied now? You know, I'll be honest with you. I think that Russia, uh, I don't think Russia wants Israel to be eliminated as an objective. Um, Russia has very, no, no, does it, I mean, Russia has, I think, very, they're very kind of realpolitik and pragmatic. I think that what happened after October 7th is that they saw a shifting uh, landscape in the Middle East. And they saw opportunities for themselves. And so they've aligned themselves in the way that they align themselves uh, because they see that it serves certain political goals for them. I don't think it's personal against Israel that they turned against Israel, which, you know, it may be a distinction without a difference, obviously, right? For if you're an Israeli, uh, it's it's a distinction that, that doesn't really make a difference. Uh, but talking about Russian motivations, I think that first, this war was a really, it came at a perfect timing for them. Uh, it distracted the world from what they are doing in, in Ukraine. Ukraine has essentially disappeared from the headlines, more or less. The, the horrors that uh, Russia is perpetrating in Ukraine have disappeared from the headlines. Uh, all of a sudden, it's becoming even harder to get help for Ukraine. Um, and I think that by doing what they're doing and by saying what they're saying, and just today, I think, or the other day, they had a massive, uh, they, they just put out another big announcement that I have yet to look at. I've only looked at the uh, descriptions of what they said. But I think, I, I think what they're doing is they're using this as an opportunity to further undermine and weaken and split the West. They see what's going on in the West. They undoubtedly understand and know the sources of what the anti-Israel left is saying. And I'm sure they're absolutely delighted because Lavrov, the foreign minister, comes from the institution, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, his entire career spent there. That institution was very much part of producing this propaganda. Putin, of course, comes out of the KGB. They're, they're, they're thrilled, I can assure you of that. You know, so they're speaking to them you know, when they're speaking against Israel. They're also speaking to the American far right, no doubt about that. Um, it's an opportunity for them to further split us, to further split the West. Uh, you know, their most recent pronouncements are against Germany, against German support for Israel. Uh, they love the fact that Israel is now accused of genocide. They used to do it all the time. Uh, it sort of undermines the moral standing um, of the entire West, you know, just the accusation alone, obviously, they don't care about facts. So I think that there is a set of pragmatic um, uh, kind of potential outcomes that fit into their longer term um, strategy. I think that that's why they're doing it. So one last quick question uh, before we let you go 
uh, the question is, can one trace the anti-Semitic views of the Mufti, the Mufti of Jerusalem during the Second World War to Russian anti-Semitism? Well, uh, I, I mean, I, I don't know. I think Mufti is something else. I think it's a it's a separate uh, story. I'm not an expert on on the Mufti, but I think that that's look. I mean, that's before. What I'm really looking at is post-67, you know, that's when the international influence really is, is felt very heavily. I think Mufti is before that. I think there are other influences there, most likely. Well, I'm going to take this opportunity to stop here and thank you, Isabel. This is really a fascinating prom, uh, presentation and a very helpful conversation. And I think we're all really much better informed um, and as we come away from this webinar, we'll be, you know, having a whole different frame of reference. So I really, really appreciate your time. Um, and Thank you so much. A pleasure, pleasure, pleasure to be here. Thank you. And thanks to all of you, the rest of you who came out to care about this topic and to come together and learn with us. Um, if you consider making a donation at the website that is going to be shown at your screen, uh, and um, uh, it's probably also listed in the chat. Um, please consider making a donation. It will help us fund future programming. In the meantime, I'd like to thank the co-sponsors of today's program, the Beth Am Jewish Israel Advocacy Committee, the Z3 and the Z3 Project uh, of the Ashman Family JCC. Thank you also to our additional partners, Congregation Beth Jacob and the Sonoma County Israel Committees. Um, just a heads up and a reminder for those of you who missed the, the, uh, the announcement at the beginning, sometime in the coming week, uh, we will share a follow-up email with all of you um, who have registered. It will include a recording of this session, which you are welcome to share with friends and family members who are not able to join us today. The email will come from uh, Maya Neve at the Palo Alto JCC.org. So if you're not usually looking for that address, um, that's where it will come from. Keep an eye out and check your junk folder in case it's mistakenly placed there. We're so glad that you could join us today uh, and be with us for this program. And we appreciate your, your attention, your, your ears, your eyes, and your hearts. Thank you for being here. Thank you for learning and enjoy the rest of your day.